Everyone and his dog seems to be doing 3D printing these days, but uh, it seems to be prevailing wisdom that injection moulding is somehow beyond the realm of possibility and costs a fortune. The reality is it's actually a lot simpler and cheaper than you might think. So here's a collection of various bits and pieces I've made over the years. This is a, a little hook for, for hanging uh, fluorescent light tubes. This is a headphone winder that I did for a school's project many years ago. I think the kids ended up selling about 500 of these for £3 each, so they did quite nicely out of it. Uh, coasters, dead easy. You can put together a coaster in an afternoon. Uh, something that's a little bit more saleable. This is a recycled plastic wigwam disc for shoving your canes through in the garden and growing your beans up. Uh, I've even done cable ties, obviously. Uh, this is a hand scrubber developed for a student at the local university. You put a scouring pad through here, there's a strap that goes over, and it's for people with bad hands so that they can scrub the dishes. Uh, these are some dowel pins that I made for somebody because uh, they wanted, I can't remember what the full remit for these things were, but anyway, they're just plastic dowel pins. Uh, what else have we got here? These are some rubber uh, bump stops for uh, a camera mount. Uh, what else? This one was uh, a little tricky to do. This is a motor coupler for a Lego axle. So this had to be spot on geometry to make with the Lego parts. But uh, not terribly difficult to do in the end. Just took a little bit of time and effort. Various light frames which uh, you may have seen if you've been watching any of my videos. And these ended up as a, a fairly nice commercial product. With uh, a back plate that you screw to your, your wall fitting and then the uh, touch sensitive uh, switch that just clips onto there. Uh, I've done enclosure end pieces for aluminium cases, the cable grommets that I did fairly recently. So yeah, there's uh, all sorts of interesting things that you can make relatively cheaply. And this is a collection of moulds that uh, I've got. I've got piles and piles of these. I must have done 300 moulds over the last 10 years. Uh, and they're just basic aluminium plates with various holes drilled in them. Uh, this I think was for some rubber feet of different sizes. This was a very early mould which looks terrible by my modern standards but this was for various rubber stamps. Uh, what we got here, this is a, that's a hook for a pegboard for hanging your tools. You can buy the perforated hardboard uh, pegboard stuff but getting plastic hooks for them seems to be quite difficult. So this was actually done for the Nottingham hack space and we got that done in the course of a day so that wasn't terribly tricky. Uh, this was a, a lenticular sheet. This is basically just lots of little lens ridges running along the plate. The hardest part with this was actually getting the, the lenticulars printed accurately enough to pick this up but once you finished it yeah you could flash this about and get a little animation going. So that was an interesting project. Uh, what else have we got in here? This one is, if I can crack it open, which I'm struggling with, uh, some little S hooks that I did for somebody years and years ago. So it's not actually as complicated as it seems. Uh, you do obviously need a, a bit of uh, equipment to be able to pull this off, but um, it's nowhere near as bad as people expect. So over the next few weeks, I'm just going to put together a few videos explaining how I go about uh, designing and making these kind of moulds and uh, the sort of uh, facilities you need to actually get from uh, an idea to uh, a product that you can go and sell. Now clearly you're going to need access to an injection moulding machine and this is a 40 ton Arberg. This is a, an ex-industrial machine. It's about 30 years old now but still going quite well. Uh, I've had to replace a few parts over the years but I picked this up for a little more than a couple of grand uh, and it served me quite well. It's basically a big hydraulic clamp at this end and a big glue gun at this end uh, and I think you probably understand the basic principles of injection moulding. Uh, you might not be able to fit something like this in your garage but uh, it's certainly something that could be acquired by a reasonably well kitted out hacker space uh, and there's a lot of subcontract moulders out there who might be willing to help you out because uh, certainly on the smaller uh, firms, they uh, often have machines like this sitting around that aren't really doing a great deal productive. So uh, if you twist their arm, they, they may well help you out. So getting access to a machine isn't impossible and there are various desktop versions available, uh, but more on that at a, a later stage. The other thing you need is a uh, mould base, and this is a, a professionally made injection mould which actually cost about £15,000 when I had it commissioned, and today it just sits in the machine and gets used as a, 
uh, a blank bolster onto which I fit those little mini moulds. So there's a couple of uh, face plates that I've attached to the front here, both sides, and I can just come along with a small mould, bolt it on, uh, and that gets the job done real quick and simple, it means I can swap moulds out very easily. Uh, you can put together something like this for you know, a few hundred pounds, I expect, just by buying blocks of aluminium and, and uh, assembling the thing in situ. But uh, these platens don't close fully, you see. There's a, there's a minimum daylight, as they call it, and you have to take account of that. So rather than making all of this every time you want a new mould, and that's the expensive part when it comes to injection moulding, you just have a, a, a dummy mould in there basically and then you can fit your small mini moulds onto this which greatly simplifies the procedure and means you can do all of the expensive work at your leisure with just a small CNC machine. And as for the, uh, the milling machine, this is an old Axminster system which I picked up about 10 years ago, I think I paid about £500 for it. Uh, they still sell them new for about £1000 but you will find them second hand uh, and this one has done more hours than I care to think about, probably about 10, 15,000 hours I've run on this. So this machine will run all day, 8 to 10 hours a day, uh, and it will hit about 10 micron accuracy after you've dialed everything in. Uh, CNC machines like this, well this isn't a CNC machine, this is a, a manual machine that I've retrofitted a CNC kit onto. But this kind of technology has been around for well over a decade now. Uh, and if you can use a 3D printer you can use something like this. A lot of schools, colleges, hacker spaces have got this kind of facility already. So getting access to a CNC milling machine, not all that difficult. And obviously a milling machine isn't a lot of use unless you've got some milling cutters, selection of slot drills, end mills, uh, ball nose cutters, dremel cutters, pretty much anything will work. You'll also find a small bench top bandsaw is pretty useful for chopping up your aluminium in the first place and a small bench top drilling machine for opening up any holes and if you've got access to a metal working lathe that's kind of useful for making small pins and inserts when necessary uh, a lot of educational establishments will have access to a lathe a lot of tech hubs and maker spaces have them as well you don't necessarily need to go buy one but certainly having access to uh, such a machine every once in a while comes in useful Another thing that comes in quite useful is uh, a drying oven and basically this gets up to about 100 degrees and you use this for drying out materials like nylons and polyurethanes because they tend to absorb moisture and of course when you're melting the plastic at 200 odd degrees the water in there is going to boil, expand into steam uh, and it just messes up your moulding and it can spit and splutter and if you get molten plastic on you uh, that stuff sticks like napalm, it takes the skin off instantly and you will have a scar. So uh, getting rid of all the moisture is quite important. You could dry stuff out in a, uh, a domestic oven I suppose if you put it on low uh, and once you've got your material dry you just leave it somewhere in a, a warm dry place in a sealed container and it's ready to go when you need it. But not all materials need drying, it's just uh, a few of the more awkward ones that you have to worry about. The other key ingredient of course is the plastic itself and this is a real motley collection of different materials I've uh, acquired over the years. Uh, a lot of this stuff frankly if you go talk to any injection moulding firm out there they will have bags sitting in the corner that they are never going to get round to using and very often they just chuck it in the skip so if you can get friendly with a local injection moulding firm you will have no problem at all acquiring plastic and for the sort of small run stuff that I do a few kilos goes a long way uh, generally it comes in 25 kilo sacks, uh, but uh, yeah, you just ask around and see what's available. You occasionally see this stuff on sale uh, on eBay and places like that as well for not a great deal of money. If you want to go buy this fresh from the suppliers, you could be paying several hundred pounds for a bag. But if you know people who are using this, you can pick a bag up off them for, you know, typically you're talking two pounds a kilogram. So it's not horribly expensive stuff. You just need to know the right people and keep your eyes open. And another useful but not always essential piece of equipment is uh, a chiller to keep your moulds cold. It's surprising how quick they do warm up. Uh, certainly if you're running a, a small bench top machine with uh, relatively small moulds in there, uh, they're going to get too hot to handle after probably just about 10 to 20 minutes. So that's going to limit your productivity. But uh, on a, a proper industrial machine, 
if you can get access to one it'll have cooling systems built into the mold and this is just basically a big fridge that circulates water through it to keep everything nice and cool uh, I generally only use this if I'm running for a few hours if I'm only doing a short run molding session you know, maybe an hour or two then uh, I can usually get away without needing this but uh, it is certainly useful to have when I'm doing bigger runs and probably only the final thing that you might need is a, a granulator you chuck your scrap material and all your reject parts in there it chops everything up and drops all of the new granules into a trough at the bottom this is quite a big machine by uh, industrial standards you can get some that are not much bigger than a, a garden shredder and there are actually plans on the internet for building your own so uh, a granulator isn't essential you can just scrap anything that doesn't come out right but you know there's a lot of plastic out there if you can get your hands on enough of it recycle it then uh, something like this does the job quite nicely and once you're armed with the right sort of equipment putting together a mold is something you can do in an afternoon it's essentially just a, a plate of aluminium with some bolt holes drilled through it so that we can mount it onto that mold base that's sitting in the machine uh, and then you cut out the design there's various ways you can do this you can either use some proper CAD software and design the part and the software will then figure out the cutting path or alternatively you can do what I do which is think in terms of how the cutter has to move around to create the geometry you want and then you just work in 2.5D kind of like a contour map uh, and that creates uh, sufficient geometry to, to get the job done. You obviously need a, a feed point at one end, uh, a runner to carry the plastic down to a suitable injection point, a couple of small gates to feed into the, the part itself and then a very small vent at the other end. Um, because the mould base that I use has got a flat plate on the injection side and a series of bolt holes on the, uh, the moving half. I can literally just get away with a single plate like this, bolt it into the machine, it closes off against the flat plate, injects through that plate into my feed point, and hey presto, you get the moulding. And you can generally get one every sort of 20-30 seconds, uh, so your production rate is 100 an hour, uh, and this is the kind of product that I was making out of this. This is actually to, to take a plug in various different uh, orientations at this end, and then you can wind the lead around this uh, bit with the uh, serrated edge uh, and then just click the wire through there so it's basically for something like um, uh, power chargers where the cable is like a meter long and you only need it to be a few inches long so this allows you to shorten the wire and tie it, tie it off and these were done for the uh, local college a few years ago a couple of years ago now a little bit of engraving on it and uh, just to be environmentally friendly we made these out of recycled milk bottle lids so we've got uh, uh, skimmed we have semi-skimmed green and we have full fat blue uh, and there's no shortage of uh, milk bottle lids out there in the wild so um, yeah it's a free source of plastic if you've got the facility for chopping it up so that's the sort of thing that you can do with very modest equipment if you don't have access to a moulding machine you can always go find a local firm that might help you out you're typically looking at 25-30 quid an hour uh, for a small machine uh, and uh, the bulk of the work is just uh, learning how to use a CNC system. But there's plenty of videos out there showing you how to do that. Uh, I'm really going to focus uh, on explaining how you design the moulds and get from an idea to a physical product. And if it's something which uh, you're trying to commercialise, you don't need to gild the lily to begin with. You can do that once you've got the gold. All you really need to do is get to something that is good enough, fit for purpose. Or uh, maybe the light switches are a better example. Yeah, you can do a slightly better quality mould if you went the industrial route but if you've got something that's good enough to get your product out there you can prove that you've got a market uh, and then if you can make some money out of it you can feed that money back into getting a professional mould done at a later date with ejector systems and all the rest of it but to get started you just need a bit of aluminium